Thank you very much for what I assume were very kind words. Of course. Uh, can you hear me okay? Excellent. Right, how are you all feeling today? I've noticed a few hangovers. It's always interesting being a speaker on the second day because everyone goes drinking um, after the first day. I see at least five hangovers this morning. Good to see that most people aren't wearing headphones, which means you should get my jokes. I suspect some of my jokes are hard to translate into Polish. So today I'm going to be speaking about the machines that betrayed their masters. But before we get into that, a little bit about me. That's me. My uh, lucky number is 11. That's my uh, Twitter handle if you're so inclined to follow me. I'm from Zimbabwe, which is a uh, small landlocked country in southern Africa. I studied in England at the University of Oxford. And I now work for an information security company, pen testing firm called SensePost, whose head office is in South Africa, but I work for the uh, London office. And we mostly do pen testing, research, a lot of training, go to Black Hat every year, that kind of thing. But enough about me, let's talk about you. This slide here, does anybody recognize any of those addresses? Maybe it's your home, maybe it's somewhere you work, maybe it's uh, the home of a colleague or a friend, or perhaps some of the photographs at the bottom, maybe that um, ring some bells. Does anybody want to own up? I can see a couple of hands nervously at the back there. What about from the Czech Republic? I noticed there's a few of us from the Czech Republic, or Latvia, England. I can see a few nervous faces, which is always a good sign. Anyone visited China recently and stayed at the uh, Silka Sea View Hotel? I think we all know who that is. <laughs> uh, I can see a hand at the back. And of course, a general welcome to everybody who's visiting here from across the globe. Our friends visiting from America, from Canada, from all over Europe, South Africa, uh, the Middle East, um, even looks like uh, Japan or South Korea down there, China. And of course, a nice spread across Europe. And seeing as that we're in uh, Warsaw in Poland, it makes sense that there's a lot of people visiting from, uh, from Warsaw. Right, so that's just a taster to see what's going to come up. So I'll discuss how I got that information in a little bit. But back to the topic that I'm speaking about, machines and betrayal. What is that all about? So the basic premise of my talk is that we all carry some kind of machine with us, be it a smartphone or an RFID tag or something, some bit of electronics that somehow gives off some signal that could betray us to those who want to track us, to harm us, or to interfere with our lives. And depending on the device, sometimes we can take that signal and move it and uh, move it to a, uh, a real person, find out who the person is or where they live, what their name is. And so the talk in general is about surveillance. And what's interesting is I put these slides together before the whole Snowden thing. So I'm not jumping on that, well, maybe I am jumping on that bandwagon afterwards, but these slides were put together before all that uh, that nonsense went down. But the surveillance that I'm interested in here is not at the government level. Perhaps the government is doing some of the stuff I'll speak about. But I wanted to build my own surveillance system on a budget. And I don't have the NSA budget, so I had to um, yeah, take my 20% research time at my company, take a small budget, and hack some stuff together, and see what kind of big brother system I could build on a budget. So as I said, we carry devices with us. That device could be one of many things. That device emits some kind of unique signature. That signature is probably dependent on the device. And then once I discover a device emitting a signature, I want to try and link that signature to a person. Now, the term signature means that it's unique. So some unique signal is being emitted. So what devices could we, uh, could we look at? So there's a lot of options out there. Um, I, no I noticed in the United States, your, um, I think they're called passport cards or identity cards. They have some kind of RFID chip, in the chip inside them that emits a signal. Uh, modern passports these days with the chips inside them, they emit some kind of signal, RFID tags. Most of these require quite, quite close proximity. 
theoretically, it should be kind of a touch type mechanism, but researchers have demonstrated that up to one and a half meters with the right equipment, you can detect these devices. Now, the challenge, of course, is once detecting the device, can you uniquely identify something from it, a serial number or a date of birth or something like that? And there's a bunch of research in that direction. But as the path of least resistance with today's existing technology, smartphones seem to be the best bet for a few reasons. Um, one, everybody carries a smartphone. Oddly enough, coming from Africa in an African context, a lot of people in the poorer areas of Africa don't have running water. They don't have uh, formal housing. They live in a shack. But they all have cell phones, and most of them have smartphones. And in fact, uh, a village that I visited, they don't have electricity, but they have smartphones. So how do you charge them? Well, there's a guy who will charge you a certain amount of money per hour to pedal on his bicycle that has a dynamo to charge your phone. Point being, cell phones are very, very prevalent these days. Uh, two, the amount of signals that they emit is quite verbose. From Wi-Fi to Bluetooth to NFC these days, um, there's all kinds of new chips going in these things. And maybe we can play with those signals to try and uniquely identify somebody. Uh, quick slide on statistics. I couldn't find anything on Poland, but my company's in South Africa. I work for the London office. So in South Africa, 10 million citizens have smartphones. It's about 20% of the population. In the UK, 20 million have smartphones, about 40% of the population. And actually, that's about a year old now, so that's probably on the increase. And more interesting is the trend. It's a lot of people, but the trend is going up very quickly. Okay, so let's pick on the smartphone. Since it's ubiquitous, most people have it. What unique signature does it emit? Well, there's a bunch of options, but the most useful to us seems to be Wi-Fi. Now, Wi-Fi is a funny protocol, and what I'll, ex what I'll explain now isn't a bug, it's part of the specification. And your mobile phone, or your tablet, or your laptop, if it has a Wi-Fi adapter, if you've left your Wi-Fi on, even if you're not in, at home or at work, you know, if you're just on the train or if you're here, if your Wi-Fi is on, your device is shouting out um, the name of every network you've previously connected to. So even if you're not actively trying to connect to a network, you're just minding your own business, your phone or your laptop is constantly looking, hey, Starbucks, are you there? Hey, PT Home Hub 123, are you there? And in those broadcast messages is, of course, the MAC address of the Wi-Fi adapter. And a MAC address is theoretically a uniquely identifying number. So from all of you here who have left your smartphones on, you're currently sending out these little beacons with your uh, unique MAC address so I can identify you in this crowd. I don't know who you are yet, but I know that that device is here. And that becomes interesting if I have enough locations where I'm monitoring for that activity. So if all over Poland I have hardware and software that can detect those signals, then I know that you're, someone is here today who was somewhere else in the country yesterday, who was in London if I have devices there the day before. So I can track people now. OK, but maybe now I've identified that somebody is here, or some device is here. Now I want to figure out who owns the device, or these days, who the device owns, it seems. So how can I link that unique signature to a person? So there's two ways that I've put forward. One is called passive linking, and we'll discuss that first. Now, as I mentioned, the smartphone sitting in your pocket is shouting out the name of every network you've ever connected to. So at least in England, um, British Telecom, if they provide your internet, your access point you get at home has a name like this, BT Home Hub hyphen four or five unique characters. So BT Home Hub, something, are you there? Starbucks, are you there? Virgin something or other, are you there? Even a broadcast message, is anybody out there? Now, that didn't used to be that interesting. And when the specification was dreamt up, I don't think the, the inventors envisioned the threat that might come of that. What's interesting is, if your phone is looking for a unique SSID, something like BT Home Hub AFVI or something, it's possible that somebody has figured out where on the planet that network is. Um, and there's a few databases with that kind of information. So databases that map the name of a network to GPS locations. So Apple has databases, Google has databases. There's those you can't really get nice access to anymore. Um, there's a provider called Skyhook who you can pay to get access to. And basically it's big databases 
um, of that information. And the way it's created is um, by a concept called war driving. Nothing new here. So war driving goes back um, to 2001, I think. But in case you're unfamiliar, this is the basic concept. So here's a map of London, and here's a bunch of networks all over London. Maybe this is in the past, because now there's probably more than four wireless networks in London. But for the uh, sake of demonstration, there's four networks in London. And there's me in the top corner there, and I'm a hacker, so I have to wear a ninja outfit. And I'm carrying my ninja outfit, and I'm carrying a device with me that has both GPS capability and Wi-Fi capability, which these days is just a phone or a tablet or something. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk all over London, and each time I walk past a network, I'm going to note the name of the network and the GPS coordinates and save it in a table like we have on the bottom of the screen there. And I'm going to walk all the streets of London all day, noting every single network and putting that information in a database. Now for London, I know where all the networks, all the wireless networks are. And from that information, I can then discover, okay, someone in this audience is looking for Virgin AFVT. When I was walking London, I noticed that it was at that street over there. Um, sorry, I find the GPS coordinates. I can plug that into Google or something and get the, the street address. So that's how I did the first couple of slides. You're all sitting here with your smartphones on. I noticed what networks you're looking for, and I looked them up in a database to get the GPS coordinates. I plugged that into Google, got the street address, plugged that into Google Street View, and got a photograph of your house. Now, the database I use is called Wiggle, W-I-G-L-E dot net, and it's a crowdsourced war driving database. So anyone can participate, and anyone can submit data, and we all share the data amongst each other. And it's a really big database. It's been running since, I think, 2001 and a really great bunch of guys, so I'd encourage you to go and support their effort and uh, war drive the planet. Right, so now I know where, where you all live, and that was completely passive, so there's no way to detect that I was doing that. What about active linking? So now I know where you live, but I want some more information. So again, this is not new technology. It goes back quite a while. But again, another weakness in the Wi-Fi specification, so it's not strictly a vulnerability, but it's part of the specification. And when your phone is looking for all of those networks it's previously connected to, I can have a device on the right of the screen there that listens for all the networks you're looking for, and when it sees your device looking for Starbucks, it responds and says, hey, iPhone, it's me, Starbucks. And then your device will say, oh, hi, Starbucks. Let me connect, serve some internet, and there you're busy browsing Facebook. And although you're at the conference here, if you're vigilant, you'll notice that you're connected to a Wi-Fi network called Starbucks, which doesn't seem right if you're here. But most people don't seem to notice that. And at that point, I can start intercepting your traffic and doing whatever I want. Just to put your minds at rest, I was only doing the passive side of things here because I don't want to go to jail. So that's all well and good. And everything I've mentioned so far is not new. This stuff's been discussed since 2004. But what is new is a framework that I've built to kind of put it all together. And I call the framework Snoopy, like the dog. I guess the name Snoopy because I'm snooping on you. Now, Snoopy, um, you can describe it with four key terms. So Snoopy is a distributed tracking, data interception, and profiling framework. And we'll have a look at what each of those individual items mean in a second. So it's, comp it's comprised of those four elements. And in terms of the architecture, it has client devices and at least one server device. The idea being that I have some client device over here, and that runs, and it messes with you, and it collects your data, and it uploads that data to a server. It's a Snoopy client, or I call it the drone, the Snoopy drone, collects data and uploads it to the Snoopy server. Right. As I said, as I warned, 2004 called, they want their tech back. So back in 2004, that was the first time that this, this vulnerability of tricking your phone in, into connecting to me came out. It was called uh, Karma, the Karma exploit. But back then, it was mostly theoretical because there weren't that many Wi-Fi devices. Difference is today, there are so many because we all have one in our pocket. Back then, it was only on your laptop, and most people didn't have laptops, so Wi-Fi really wasn't around. So there's much more opportunity for betrayal because we all carry at least one smartphone with us these days. 
So that's one justification. The other justification, so existing tools do exist. Has anyone ever used um, technology called the pineapple from Hack5? Okay, three of us. So the pineapple is slightly similar to what I've done here. So it's a small access point um, and it just has the rogue facility. So it'll trick you into connecting to it and maybe serve you some internet. But any data interception is very trivial, it's simple, and it's saved on the device. So as a pen tester, as a hacker, which is my job, I tried this tool out about a year ago and I, I bought one and I went to go and uh, hack my client um, legally and I dropped this in the organization, this pineapple device. And yeah, people started connecting and it started intercepting the traffic and saving it on the device. Then I had to drive back the next day and take out the little SD card and put it in my laptop and open Wireshark and look for interesting streams. So it's very convoluted to use. And I had a third point, but I can't remember it, so never mind. So the Snoopy framework, what's it all about? So as I said, we have a drone, which is the client side. And the drone can be any Linux device that has outbound internet, either via 3G or Ethernet, or whatever you want, but outbound internet access, running Linux, and a Wi-Fi adapter that supports what we call monitor mode or a promiscuous mode via injection drivers, which basically means most laptops with an external Wi-Fi card, a Raspberry Pi, a BeagleBone, a Nokia N900, any of this kind of tech. And this is how it works. So my drone, if it was on, it would be running here. That's one example. The other example is the uh, Nokia N900, which I'll get in a second. And there's you in the audience with your cell phones or your laptops looking for networks that you previously connected to. And my device hears those requests and looks them up via the Wiggle database and via Google. It also pretends to be those networks and tricks your device into connecting to it, serving you internet. And there's an example of the software running on a Nokia N900 phone, which is super convenient because it's small, it's not obvious, it has all the tech we need. So how does the server fit into this picture? So instead of the drone having direct outbound connection, what we have the drone fires up there, and as it boots, it creates a VPN connection to a server that I have on the internet, the Snoopy server. And therefore, I can have multiple drones. I can drop 50 drones all over London or all over Warsaw, and they all connect back to a central server. And the drones, therefore, are quite dumb. They just collect data, so they hear you probing for networks, and they just grab that data, upload it straight to the server, which means on the server, I can do all the data analysis and manipulation in one point. So they're now on the server, I save in a database, the uh, names of the networks you're looking for, I try and do geolocation, I also offer you internet access. And of great interest, what I did, so on the server, instead of having direct outbound access, I set up a transparent proxy. So your cell phone here connects to my Snoopy drone, which connects to the server, which plugs into a transparent squid proxy. That's just a web proxy. Transparent means you don't know it's happening. It just goes through this proxy. And I fiddled with squid a bit to encourage it to log more data than it should log. So it logs your IP address, the site you're looking at, and your cookie. Now getting squid to log cookies was tricky, but I managed to uh, massage it into doing that. So all of this is going into the Snoopy database. So I know where you live, and now I'm grabbing your cookies. So you're browsing Facebook, and I grab your cookie. I pass it through a tool called SSL Strip by Moxie Marlin Spike. Who's familiar with that tool? Okay, a few of us. So SSL Strip's a lovely tool which allows you to basically destroy SSL. Go and read about it, but it's a cute way to trick your client into not using SSL, but using clear text, which means that any passwords and whatnot over the wire, I'm gonna grab those too. So the Squid Proxy plugs into SSL Strip, and then that plugs into uh, man, a, a man-in-the-middle proxy written in Python, which allows me to do arbitrary traffic injection. So for example, every web page you view, I can inject um, some JavaScript code, which maybe profiles your device. And with JavaScript, I can figure out a lot about your device. I can figure out your screen resolution, um, what plugins you have installed, what fonts you have installed, your user agent, enough to figure out perhaps that you're running an old version of Flash or an old version of Java for a further exploitation down the road. I can also inject pictures of funny cats, which is always cool. But my favorite 
is to turn images upside down. And that works great in Starbucks. Starbucks is always full of hipsters, and they sit there with their, uh, their iPads, I don't know, doing whatever hipsters do, browsing Flickr or something. And they sit there browsing Flickr, and they're going through my tech, and I turn every page upside down. So they have their tablet, and everything's upside down. So they turn the tablet upside down, and then it turns upside down, and look very confused, and they just sit there, rotating it. And of course, I'm sitting in the back with my hacker balaclava, having a good laugh. Of course, that's a completely fictitious story, and I never did that. We can also um, inspect traffic. And again, what's convenient here is all traffic is going through the central server, and it's going through one interface, TAP0, the uh, OpenVPN interface. I do all my inspection there as opposed to individual interfaces on these devices. And I can pull out PDF documents, I can pull out VoIP conversations, um, and all that kind of stuff. And then what's a lot of fun is I can do um, social media analysis. So there's a lot of fun to be had there. Everyone's browsing Twitter and Facebook and all of that jazz. And because in the uh, squid proxy section I've stolen your cookie, I can therefore impersonate you. So I, I have access to your Facebook account. So I can grab all of your friends or your inbox or whatever, grab your, all your tweets and everything. And I have a, um, a front end to Snoopy, which we'll see in a second, which allows you to nicely browse that data. So in a graphing environment, so a little nodes, blip, 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 for everyone's uh, friends and relationships. OK, and that's um, the software running on the server. So again, cute little menu. Now, a side note worth mentioning is the way I've set up the OpenVPN architecture is such that the server up top there has direct access to the clients. So natting, uh, network address translation, happens on the server, not on the drone. What that means is two very interesting things, which people haven't done before. On the server, I see the IP address of the victim on the far end, not of the drone, because natting happens up there. What that also means is from the server, I can directly access the client or the victim. So I can ping the victim directly from my server, or of more interest, I can fire a Metasploit exploit directly at the connected devices. And because I can profile the devices via JavaScript injection, I know right, he's running this old version of whatever software, I can fire my exploits directly at him without having any heavy software on the drone itself. So the drone is dumb, it just passes traffic. Other solutions have usually put like the, the, um, the pineapple and the um, the Pwn phone and the Pwn box, all those kinds of devices, they put heavy software on the device, which runs ridiculously slow. And also, if the device is compromised, all the data is on there, and depending who you are and what you're doing, you may get in trouble. OK, enough talking. Let's have some demos. Who is familiar with a tool called Multigo? Excellent. For those of you who are not, I would uh, encourage you to go and get a copy. It's actually written by one of the guys who founded my company, SensePost. He left SensePost to start this company. And it's a graphing engine, a data visualization and graphing engine. So it has a security twist, but basically you can um, manipulate data, explore data any way you want. And you can write your own, what we call, entities and transforms for it. So this is the software here. So I didn't write the software, I just wrote software for the software. So if you see on the side here, it's got a whole bunch of different kinds of entities. So for example, you can drag in things like domain names and figure out who owns the domain and things like that. But what I did is I wrote a bunch of entities down here for Snoopy. And you see over here, I've dragged on what I, what the, the, the starting node, I'll call it, called the base of operations. So there's me with my satellite dish. And each entity that you have on the map, you can run what we call a transform against it. And that just means, given this device, submit that to the server and get some data back. So for example, I just ran a transform called fetch drones. Now what's cool is the software is running on my laptop, but it's querying a server out on the internet. So you, you can all install Multigo on your own laptops. You don't have to have the Snoopy server. I just give you a little key, and you can access the server, and we can all analyze the data together. In fact, with the latest version of Multigo, we can share the same graph. We call this a graph. So you could all log into Multigo now. I'd give you a key, and we could explore this data together. So what we see here, 
These are all the Snoopy drones that I've had in operation over the last year. And I can run another transform called fetch locations. Just make that full screen for a second. So when the software boots up and starts running, I give it a physical location. I tell it where I'm at. So for example, here I was running this drone at 44Con last year. This was at Security in Scotland earlier in the year, ITWeb in South Africa this year and last year, uh, Black Hat EU this year, B-Sides London this year, um, DEF CON this year. This is uh, yesterday. So if you were here yesterday, this is potentially you, 44Con, Black Hat Vegas. So basically all these security conferences I go to, I um, collect data. So let's pick on you guys. So I can uh, fetch clients from location. Hey, it's you guys. This is a security conference, right? You should turn your Wi-Fi off. OK, so here's all of you. And if you zoom in, you'll notice the names are not perhaps that obvious. But if you click on a device, so hit that, that says it's Apple. And it calculates that from the MAC address. So every product manufacturer, the first half of the MAC address delineates who made the thing. So you can figure out who, ma or who made the wireless device. It's not always obvious what the device is, so I can tell you that one is probably a Nexus 7 device, and that's kind of just from trial and error. So let's just pick a small subset down there. These guys look like they want to have some fun. So from you guys, I can then say fetch SSIDs. So that's now fetching the networks that those devices have been probing for. And I can just, yeah, it's finished. If no results come back, so these guys didn't return any results, that means they're just um, looking for what we call a broadcast probe request. So no specific name. Whereas these guys down here, so CNK hotspot, that's quite a popular one. NASC, NASC, not that interesting. When you get ones like this, that's more interesting, because that looks quite unique. So if you pick a unique one like that one, we can say, fetch location of that SSID. And if nothing comes back, that means it's not in the, in the Wiggle database. It's always tricky doing live demos. Let's grab some more. Now, it's interesting when you start to see ones like these guys over here. A, these ones seem quite noisy. Let me know if you see yourself. Um, that one looks kind of unique. Adobe, cool. Uh, there we go, it's a good hit. So this person looks like they're from Poland. And if you double click that, so you can see a, in the icon, you can see a street view photograph. So Google's not that good at knowing which side of the road the house is on, so it's probably pointing the camera the wrong way. But if you look here, he has the street address, and let's grab the Google map. Uh, in fact, let's grab the street view. And as that loads up, yeah, so we see Poland. So it's probably somewhere around here. <laughs> It's a road sign. Does that look familiar to anybody? It's one of you. So that has all kinds of implications. So when you see someone looking for a lot of different networks, you can potentially figure out where they live, where they work. At least in England, um, there's a convention, BT Home Hub is home um, internet. BT Business Hub is an organization. So if I see one person looking for a home hub and a business hub, right away I know where they work, where they live. And sometimes you find a few interesting ones. So for example, last time I gave this demo, it was a bit awkward because I did what I just did here. And then we noticed one of the other SSIDs he was looking for was Hooters Sucks. And we did a geolocation of that. And it turns out it's a strip club in the States. So that kind of stuff can get you in trouble. Okay, what else can we do? So I prepared something earlier. Okay, that's all of you guys. So here, this is everybody and all the networks we're looking for. So you see there's some super noisy devices. Look at this one here. This is looking for, geez, what's that, about 30 different networks, wow. 
So you can imagine the, the wealth of information we can profile on this person here. So this is clearly a traveler. St. Gregory Hotel, something coffee. So a whole bunch of interesting options there. Um, I had another one I saved earlier. Uh, so this device, yeah, let's do this one from the beginning. So what's interesting as well, remember the, uh, the first, one of the first slides where I saw that, uh, fish, where I noticed that um, someone had stayed in a hotel in China. And based on the speakers yesterday, we can probably figure out who that is. <laughs> Hope he's not here. Um, as an example, I don't mean to pick on him, but because what I'm doing here is I'm profiling people, tracking people, trying to understand people, if it turns out that is him, I can look at what other networks he's looking for and then potentially find out where, he's, where else he's traveled to and where he lives and getting that kind of correlation. Okay, here's an interesting one I found just before the talk, looking for a bunch of different networks, which is ID locations. As far as I understand, that it means Czech Republic, I think. So someone's been Czech Republic, Canada, Slovenia, and again, you get photographs. Very nice. As an anecdote, when I was first writing the software, I was sitting in a coffee shop in Oxford, and um, two gentlemen walked into the coffee shop, empty coffee shop, two gentlemen walked in speaking Arabic to each other. And as they walked in, they popped up on my graph, and it geolocated to some small town in the back end of Saudi Arabia and instantly I knew where they were from. Okay, what else can we do? So here's Poland again, and I can say fetch clients with data. So as an example, back in the hotel, I enabled the rogue access point mode and connected to, connected to it myself. So I'm attacking myself here, because I know if I start intercepting your Facebooks, you're gonna beat me up. So here's my own device, and it's my tablet, and I can see what networks I'm looking for, a whole bunch. Hakito guest, yep, I was at Hakito Ergosum. So we could probably geolocate that to my address in one of the countries I've lived in. But now we're playing with data. So let's do uh, fetch domains. So these are all the domains that that device was browsing. And if the device is browsing Facebook, I make it a Facebook icon, doesn't mean they're logged in. What I can do then is run this transform that says fetch Facebook. Uh, they were logged into Facebook and I managed to steal their cookie. So there's me. I can do something like fetch Facebook friends. It turns out I have no friends. So if, <laughs> if you guys want to be friends with me, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Okay, see down here, it's still running, so I might have friends. Maybe the outbound internet, oh, there we go. I have too many friends was the problem. It took a while to load the graph. So there are all my Facebook friends. And what I can also do from this node, so this is the starting point, I have a transform that says, fetch all Facebook profiles I've managed to intercept. And here, so here are some colleagues whose Facebook profiles I've managed to intercept as well. Um, I should be my boss somewhere. Yeah, so there's Charles. Um, you can see we have, we're friends with each other, that's why we're linked. I could get Charles friends, look at the overlap, and we can do all kinds of interesting analysis there. Um, another example, I've got seven minutes left. So here's Poland, here's looking at you guys. Here are all the countries that I've managed to geolocate you guys to. And I can convert that to a bubble view and weight it. And that creates a nice diagram illustrating um, the number of the prevalence of the countries that attendees have visited. So a lot of people from the US and or have visited places in the US and Poland. UK quite a lot, Latvia, a few from Switzerland, Czech Republic. So that's cool. What we can also do, so from that big graph where I had every one of all the networks you're looking for, um, I do a bit of analysis here. So I, I run what we call a machine, and the machine just, I give it some logic and it prunes the graph. And I told it, remove all SSIDs that only one person is looking for, also remove ones that more than 10 are looking for. So more than 10, that's stuff like Starbucks, not so interesting, everyone's looking for Starbucks. If only one person's looking for it, not that interesting. If two people or three people or four people are looking for one network, that could mean people from the same company, people from the same home, people who have some relationship with each other. 
And then we get a graph like this where we see okay, Linksys, not that interesting. Um, that one maybe, that looks quite unique. Project Tori, so two devices looking for Project Tori. Maybe the same person with two devices, or maybe people uh, who work together or something. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, this one over here, so this is every conference I've been to. And it's weighted um, by the number of repeat observations. So the bigger the blob, the more people I've seen at multiple conferences. So you take B sides here, and so here, for example, this device was observed at both B-Size 2013 and 44Con 2012. Oddly enough, at this conference, I think there, were only, there was only one, only one device that was observed somewhere else, that device. So I think people who have seen me speak before were cautious and turned off their Wi-Fi. Um, I think I might have time for one last example. Here's a photograph taken in our new sense post office in South Africa. That's me with a beard. I can run a transform to get EXIF data from the photograph. Whoops, we left EXIF data inside the photograph, so we know the GPS coordinates. From that, I wrote uh, another transform that will, given those coordinates, so not from my database, go and query the Wiggle database, and within a one kilometer radius, give me the names of all networks around that area. What that means is, one of these networks may belong to SensePost, because there's our office, these networks are around our office. Right, so what? So at that point, I can select all of those, and I can say, fetch clients from SSIDs. So from all the conferences I've been to over the last year, all my devices, maybe I've dropped them all over London, have I observed anybody who was looking for one of those networks? Now, what would that reveal? That would reveal that I've observed somebody who works at SensePost. So, these ones seem kind of common, not that interesting, IntelliNet, blah, blah, blah. That one there may be more interesting. And we see a bunch of devices. So these devices are looking for that network, which is around the SensePost office. And I've observed them somewhere before in my database. And now I'm looking at what other networks they're looking for. And this guy, hey, who does sucks? There's my joke from earlier. Maybe it was me. Um, and we see stuff like 44Con and 44Con. So yeah, probably SensePost staff. Uh, Caesars Palace, that's in Las Vegas. So the point there is that we can very quickly figure out um, yeah, so who people are. And I, I picked SensePost there because I don't want to pick on another company, but I have tested with other companies. A nice example is at 44Con this year, at 44Con this year, um, sorry, not 44Con, at DEF CON, uh, feds weren't allowed to come. So I was running my Snoopy stuff, and then I pre-populated locations where federal buildings are, like FBI and CIA, and just in those towns, and looked for anybody at the conference who was looking for those networks, which maybe I could have caught a fed like that. Maybe I can't tell you about it. Um, other stuff I'm working on, attaching the stuff to quadcopters, I've got about a minute left. That's kind of cool. Here's some data from all the conferences I've been to. So here's you guys at CERT Poland. So I've seen 598 devices. There's about 500, maybe 400 of you here, which I'm not sure if that data has any actual use device per person, a very, very rough metric. Probably doesn't mean that much. And I think I might have time for one question. Um, that's SensePost, the company I work for. That's my email address. Maybe you want to work for us or do cool stuff with us. And that's my Twitter handle if you want to hang out with me. Thank you very much. Zapraszam do zadawania pytań. Any questions? Uh, I guess some part of this problem can be solved by randomizing MAC addresses. And, you know, like uh, some ROMs for Android are trying to do that. Is there any talk in the hardware industry about this problem? Yep, so I have a whole other talk on how to defend ourselves against this. So the one idea, yeah, randomize your MAC address. But what you find then is I can quite quickly fingerprint you based on the networks you're looking for. So it's probably only, you're probably the only person looking for a network in South America and Italy and Australia with those network names. So what you really want to do is one, randomize your MAC address, and two, flush your lists.
but our devices are really looking for ASCII names of SSIDs or yeah, or MAC addresses of the. So they don't look for the MAC address of the device. So there is an Apple bug in iOS 5, I think, that would look for the MAC address of previous devices. But in general, it's just the ASCII network name. Well, it's not actually defined as ASCII or Unicode, but the name of the network. So it only looks for the SSID. So with Apple devices, you can't selectively remove them. You have to flush all of them or none of them. With Android devices, you can selectively remove them, which is probably a good idea. Um, so I'm speaking at um, Zero Nights in Moscow next month. I'm releasing a new version of Snoopy, and that has one, uh, extra functionality that allows you to, so it impersonates just your networks, allows you to connect to them, and then say forget, which seems to be the only way on a not jailbroken Apple device to, to tackle that. Interesting, thanks. Sure. Anybody else? Czy są jeszcze jakieś inne pytania? So Glenn, I would like to ask you a question. Has, has the NSA been contacting you for some help or? Not the NSA, but um, I couldn't comment any more on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Great. Thank you very much.